You are listening to the To and Out CFL Podcast, a proud member of the Canadian Football Podcast Network. Grab some poutine and a double-double. It's time for the To and Out CFL Podcast. Now they have to kick it out, and they do! Every week, Travis Cura. Does anybody still care about this podcast? And Brazilian Tide. Hunters are people, too. Talk fantasy football, bring you the latest in CFL news, and sprinkle in a little bit of nonsense. Are you kidding? Set. Hunt. All right. And we are a part of the Alberta Podcast Network, locally grown, community supported. Uh, Brazilian Ty is joined with me. Actually, we have a lot of people uh, joined with me right now. I'm Travis Curra. And man, this is uh, exciting. It's kind of sad that we aren't all in Regina right now. I've got my uh, Rough Rider gear on right now. It, uh, it hurts Ty. It hurts that we weren't, nobody wants to be in Regina, but. <laughs> yeah, people that live there don't want to be there, I don't think. It, it hurts not to be there right now. Uh, it hurts emotionally, but not fiscally. If that, yeah, that's true. That, that, that would be how I would put it after, you know, what I spent this spring and summer uh, <laughs> by not working and pulling a mattress into my living room for two months at a time. Uh, it's nice to uh, replenish the bank account and not have to worry about another expense. I did make the most of my uh, Grey Cup Unite, so I've been kind of throwing a little solo party, and I created a new recipe. Um, I know that uh, I actually had a request on Friday not to talk about any sort of gross food, but I, I just have to talk about uh, the dish that I created Friday night. I rewatched the 2013 Grey Cup, and <laughs> I boiled some pierogies. I fried them up. Okay. And then I threw some cheese curds on there and doused it in uh, poutine gravy. <laughs> Why am I not surprised? <laughs> like you would you ruined the pierogies, but I, I get it. Oh look, see Connie saying on the chat that it just looked delicious. It was probably one trillion percent of my daily uh, sodium intake. <laughs> <laughs> like me adding salt to my chocolate milk like like it needs more salt right like i need to ingest more sodium is that a thing we got the yeah. chat live right now do people salt their uh chocolate milk like i i don't know that that like i'm not talking like a bunch like just a pinch just a pinch of salt yeah. wow Okay, uh, the reason we're here, we're <laughs> gathered virtually <laughs> <laughs> on uh, 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 to an OLED. Um, People we, are unhappy with me right now. <laughs> we've teamed up with our friends at CFL Fans Fight Cancer. Of course, last year was massive. I think it was over $15,000 raised in Calgary, which mm -hmm. is incredible, uh, an incredible number. And so far, well, right now, the last time I looked, there were $1,302 raised for the Chris Knox Foundation, which is mind-blowing. We're not together. We all came together for this little Zoom call. We're going to be eating some Timbits. At least Peter Dayakowski and I am are going to be eating some Timbits later. And over $1,300 raised. So well done. Thanks for coming on. Thanks for supporting this show. We do have some prizes to give away today. We'll get to that very, very soon. This episode of Two and Out is brought to you by the Calgary Foundation. Whether it's funding, anti-racism programs, addiction recovery, or food hampers for the hungry, for 65 years, the Calgary Foundation has proudly supported the charitable community to address some of Calgary's biggest challenges. Now, during this period of unprecedented urgent needs, the Calgary Foundation renewed its commitment to building a healthy, vibrant, giving, caring, and resilient community. If you're a registered charity, looking for a grant, a professional advisor creating a giving plan for your client, or a donor wanting to give back to community, discover a wealth of resources at calgaryfoundation.org and learn more about their work through Calgary Foundation's Facebook, Twitter, or Instagram. I, I do want to announce that Derek Mapstone is the winner of a $50 gift card to Sport Check just for showing up today. And Ty, I wanted to try something here. Mm -hmm. I don't know if it's going to <laughs> Is there the uh, raise hands uh, function at the beginning? Maybe, maybe not. Maybe not. Oh, but yes. There, you're the IT guy. There is. They're raising hands right now. Okay, so what I want to try, 
I've got game codes to give away. Thank you to Canuck Play. They showed up and uh, supplied us with uh, codes to Doug Flutie's Maximum Football. We got one Xbox One code and we've got one PlayStation 4 code. So here's what I'm going to do. Uh, the next two people that uh, raise their hands, uh, <laughs> we're going to uh, let them play paper, rock, scissors <laughs> and win a game code. <laughs> I have no clue if this is going to work, but we're live. That's what it's all about, right? Okay. Uh, yeah, we'll do it live. Okay. I'm selecting uh, Doug Ford. Oh, make sure you. The legend. Uh, it's not the premier of Ontario. <laughs> Uh, make sure you pay attention to your uh, your phone. It'll give you an option. It'll bring you back in. And Dave McCauley. We'll bring Dave McCauley in. Uh, make sure you unmute your mic, and we're going to promote you to a panelist and bring you back in here. Uh, let's see. I've got Doug Ford. Make sure you unmute your mic. Dave, make sure you show us your video. If you don't have video, then uh, maybe... Uh, We'll have to do uh, pick a number between one and ten or something like that. Okay, there's Dave. Dave, how's it going, man? <laughs> <laughs> how you doing? Doing all right. How you doing? I'm doing. I'm doing pretty good. What team do you cheer for? Uh, I'm a big fan of the CFL more than anything, but I am here in Toronto, so nice. That's what today's all about, isn't it? Normally celebrating the Grey Cup. Yeah, you heard the boo uh, exactly. <laughs> from all over Canada. All right, yeah. uh, Doug Ford, are you there, my friend? I know. Uh, oh boy, no, guess not. <laughs> oh, I hear you now. You're Can you hear me? Yeah, okay. yeah. Okay. Well, man, here we go. Okay, fair enough. <laughs> <laughs> we can't see you right now, so I'm going to have to trust that you're not cheating here. Um, oh, there we. Go. Oh, there we go. Okay. <laughs> Paper, rock, scissors here. Okay. So, Ty, what are the rules? Three, two, one. Then you do your thing. That's, that's how I've always done it, but I didn't have a dad to show me how to play. So I think you need to, I think you need to make the rules. Okay. We'll do three, <laughs> one, bang. Okay. Dave and Doug, are you ready? Okay. Three, two, one. Paper beats. Oh, paper. No. <laughs> <laughs> We got you a game. Like scissors, cuts Woo. paper. <laughs> nice. Jeez. Thanks for taking part, guys. We're going to get two more contestants here because we have uh, two more codes to give away right now. Let's go to Manone. We're going to promote her to a panelist, and we're going to go to, uh, I think, I think Andrea here. Asked to unmute, promote to panelist. This is this is blowing my mind. The technology tie. We never have to see people again, and I am all for it. <laughs> Especially security guards, the spirit of Edmonton. If I never see them again, I'm, my life will be complete. Hi, Andrea. How's it going? Hi, good. I'm excited I to am doing... figure out how to use a code. Are you a big gamer? <laughs> uh, not a big gamer, a little bit. I'm pretty obsessed with uh, Tomb Raider. I don't think oh. they make any more, though. <laughs> yeah, that's, that's what, 1997, Ty? <laughs> <laughs> I've never played Tomb Raider in my life. Okay, Manone, are you a gamer? Oh, hi. Okay, <laughs> awesome. We're going to do another battle here of paper, rock, scissors, and we'll see how it goes. Three, two, one, show your symbol. Three, two, one, go. Ah. Rock beats scissors. <laughs> Thanks. Well done, Manone. We'll get a hold of you after the show and let you know uh, how to redeem that. Thanks again to Canuck Play for helping us out uh, with those codes. Ty, uh, Grey Cup Unite started with the uh, State of the League address, and the word of the day was optimism. Did it inspire optimism with you? What do you think? <laughs> we've, been, we've been on this train for six months. So I, I probably listened to half a dozen Randy Ambrosi interviews this week, and uh, that one, it seemed like it was all about the vaccine. And it, it kind of struck me, if there's no vaccine, then what happens? You know, uh, yeah. what what's going to happen here? But then he, uh, in other interviews, sort of said, he was on the Rod Peterson show and said that basically this gives them 
more, I don't know what you want to call it, but another angle when they're talking to officials, government health officials about getting a season for next year. It does seem like they're not really considering the whole bubble situation. I don't know if that's smart. Smart. What about you, Ty? I don't know how you could do a bubble with that many people. Right. Yeah. Team, right. Like teams are an entire team and staff and everything. I just don't see it as fiscally viable. Um, mm-hmm. And at the same time, I see him, especially in the state of the league with the vaccine talk and all that stuff, that it's just another passing the buck. Like, if we don't have this, then, you know, it, it's not our fault if we can't make this work. Is how I kind of read it. I get the whole optimism as the word of the day thing, basically is what it was. But I, I have zero until we have something set in stone. Because we talked about it all summer or all spring and all summer. Like, there's a chance, there's a chance, there's a chance. I never thought there was. And I hated being right. Well, that, that's a lie. But you know what I mean? Like, it just didn't see it. It was, I I had no issue not getting my hopes up because if you keep your expectations low, it's really hard to be disappointed. That's a, g- a great mantra to live by. <laughs> that's what I tell all the women. <laughs> I uh, I had no hope at the beginning of the week, but then by the end of the week, there's just this, this hope, this boyhood wonder, you know, staring into the sky, the stars at night, just hoping that we're going to have a season next year, but we're just going to have to wait. One thing I will say, it does look like they, they released a schedule mm-hmm. that this off season is going to be almost a normal off season. Everybody that was going to be a free agent in February is going to be a free agent and it's going to be as normal as possible of a, of an off season. It's kind of crazy. And I mean, that gives some sense of normalcy. Yeah. Uh, at the same time, raising expectations. But if they are able to get a season off, they have to be able to build their like jams need to be able to build their teams, and teams need to be able to find players and and staff and all that stuff. So I get it. But let's not count the chickens before the eggs hatch, right? Like it's it'll be great for news and to stay relevant and all that stuff, but it doesn't mean anything in the long run. Yeah, the the draft lottery was announced yesterday. <laughs> and it, it's going to be a unique draft because it was just a random draw. They had no standings this year to base off the lottery from. So conspiracy. I, <laughs> hey, mute him. <laughs> 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 yeah, throw that in there. Throw that in there anytime you want. So the Democrats pick number one, but they also pick twice in the first round. That Johnny Manziel trade is just the gift that keeps on giving. They <laughs> they already have a depth of Canadian talent, and looks like they're just going to get more, aren't they? And may, may, maybe they trade that pick to get some help on defense because that probably was an issue on Great Cup Sunday along with the tackle position the year it looked good (laughs) and especially at the top and maybe offensive line at the tackle position was a little bit of an issue too it's kind of fun well in the game i mean but anybody like how would you fare against willie jefferson (laughs) take note at the knees i I would buy a ticket uh to see uh (laughs) just that let's uh bring in some more guests here we've got almost every representative Uh, from the Canadian Football Podcast Network on the call. What we're going to do here is uh, start with the Eastern Division. So we're going to bring the entire Eastern Division here onto the call right now to see, you know, what their thoughts were of Grey Cup Unite. Janine, as I get everybody else set up, uh, did you take part in the Grey Cup Unite festivities at all? How did it make you feel? Uh, I got to... I got to uh, follow along a lot on Twitter. I didn't take part in uh, anything other than the commissioner's, uh, the commissioner's state of the league, but just following on Twitter and seeing everybody's memories and, and doing this, I've been really ridiculously excited all week to see all of you guys because uh, we would normally all be together right now. So uh, it does make me feel good that we are still connected enough that even in a time like this, we are able to find ways to whether it's virtually through Zoom or whether we're talking to one another on uh, on our social media, that we're still able to to be together and talk about football. It's a really great thing. I did end up watching uh, the Champions Roundtable that they had Paul Lapolis, Mike Benavides, and Bob Dice mm-hmm. uh, chatting around. I I know after last year, it's like, 
it's a year and a half of a rough season that you're kind of dwelling on. Um, but to have those coaches, they're all champions on that staff, it must give you hope for 2021 and beyond. Oh, for sure. I think we were feeling a lot of uh, hope already pre pre COVID. We were all feeling a lot more hope for 2020 uh, than we had felt in 2019. 2019 was a really tough time for uh, for the Ottawa Red Blacks and their fans. But when you bring on somebody like Paul Lapolice, who's such a proven uh, who's such a proven coach, uh, it's a really great feeling. Um, what he did in Winnipeg, without as many of the offensive weapons as some of the other teams, uh, as some of the other teams have, brought a lot of hope to uh, to Ottawa. So we're definitely ready to go in uh, in 2022. And um, I saw the schedule come out like everybody else did, and um, optimism is the word for sure. Uh, I might be a little more in Ty's camp. I, I I don't know if I'm yet ready to get my hopes too high up but uh, but I am going to try to stay as positive as I can and and hope for a really great season uh, under Paul Lapolis's leadership in 2022 20, 2021 sorry I'm going ahead by a whole other year, <laughs> <laughs> <Next> year. <laughs> so yeah that's what the schedule like the way it is because it's unbalanced it's almost like if we miss the first you know month or so of the season then there's still plenty of divisional games to be played to figure out the standings, even if it doesn't start till next Labor Day. And that's what a lot of fans seem to be. Okay, we're not going to start till Labor Day. Are you kind of in that, uh, that camp? I think, yeah, I would say, Travis, that uh, best case scenario, I don't see us starting out of the hop in, in, in June. Um, I think we probably are even in May because the schedule, they have the preseason games going into May. Um, I think we're probably going to look at, if we're talking about the vaccine being rolled out in the spring, uh, the people on this podcast are probably not the first people to get that vaccine. We're going to be giving it out to our healthcare workers. We're going to be giving it out to vulnerable populations Um, and CFL fans. We're not a vulnerable population. We're a pretty strong group of people. So uh, it's going to be a while before they roll it out to enough people, I think, that we can have mass gatherings again. Uh, but uh, I think I'm more in the world where we might see something closer to the fall, but even a truncated season, because I'll take it, because it has been hard. It has been, a, I read a lot more now that I don't watch four, four football games a week, but, uh, but I miss my football. All right, let's 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 talk Argos a little bit because at the beginning of the week, it almost looked, Will, like uh, the Argos were going to steal the show. Like they released the great video with the boat logo. How is the fan base feeling about that new slash old logo? Everybody's been begging the Argos to go back to this logo for years now. They yeah. originally had it in the 70s and 80s when the team was at its peak in Toronto. And, um, you know, I wasn't expecting them to go back to the original, but you know, they came up with a, a modern interpretation of it. And, you know, I'm excited. They've already got some merchandise out on uh, the Real Sports website and looking forward to see if they, how they incorporate it into the jerseys, whatever they look like. And uh, they even gave us a little, I don't think you can see it, but they gave us a little lapel pins about nice. two or three weeks ago. So oh, you they, weren't, <laughs> they weren't shy about telling us it was going to be coming back. Right, that's cool. Speak, speaking of coming back, uh, when the new when the new season starts or whenever we get started again, do you think having this entire season and another off season is going to help a new coach like Ryan Dinwiddie, or is it going to kind of hinder uh, the start of the year? Uh, it it may help. Well, I mean, even if he has another year to scout talent out there, mm-hmm. he still doesn't have that practical experience with game decisions. So while I don't think it's going to be a a hindrance necessarily, I think not having this season may be, may have been a disadvantage simply because, you know, you've lost one year now because of this. Mm -hmm. And then you're going to have another year where, yes, there may be those growing pains as a, as a new coach, but he sounds like he's working hard and, uh, Gave his, uh, the Argos has state of the franchise uh, on Tuesday. And they said, you know, I gave the coaching staff two weeks off once they uh, canceled the season. But since then, they've been assigned, you know, you go watch this conference, this college conference, you go watch this college conference. 
So, I mean, they're, they're busy at work as I'm sure is all the, you know, the other eight coaching staffs as well. Let's uh, talk to our friends in Montreal now, uh, Cliffy D and uh, Tim Capper from the Alouette's Flight Deck podcast. Cliffy, I, I know the season hurts everyone, but I thought Montreal might have been the team that had the most to be excited for. Kahari Jones, Vernon Adams Jr., there's a new owner. It just seemed like finally there is something to be excited for. How do they keep that excitement going in the next season? Well, that's the thing that I, I I feel personally disappointed about as far as the lack of a 2020 season is that, yeah, finally now it seems like the Alouettes have their ducks in a row. They finally have stable ownership. They have a GM. They have a president. Uh, like you said, Kahari Jones, Vernon Adams. Like this, like, this is the perfect storm now. Now this seems like the opportunity for the Alouettes to finally prove that, they're, that, that last year wasn't a fluke, that now that they finally got themselves back on track. And the fact that they had no season this year kind of put a damper on those things. Uh, whether or not this is going to maintain into 2021, I think it's going to be the big test uh, as, as far as I'm concerned. Like I, I have to believe that all the pieces are still in place for the most part on the field. Now that everything's sort of settled off the field, now I want to see just how that's going to execute because I think Tim and I, we had sort of uh, cautious optimism, if you will, about whether or not Danny Machocha would be the man that's going to be able to put together the winning or keep the keep the winning formula I should say in place in Montreal so to me I think that was going to be the big question mark going into 2020 and now that question has been sort of pushed into 2021. And you know with the stability now with with the franchise and Vernon Adams and Gary Jones like we were talking about the momentum at the beginning Tim now they get to play on Thanksgiving again and this this has to be huge for you especially as being the one person who beats the drum on Twitter about it. <laughs> oh, and, and for, for the Alouettes specifically, a lot of people need yeah. to remember is that the Owls don't have any traditions. They really don't mm -hmm. have any, you know, it's not like Labor Day. It's not like, the, you know, the game after Labor Day, et cetera. But it, it's, even though it was taken away, I'm glad they brought it back because it gives us uh, the chance really now to have and continue our tradition, even though we're going to have a two-year break I guess we could say from what's it 13 or 14 straight years in a row mm -hmm. so it's I, I'm just happy I'm just happy we're gonna be able there and have our own tur <laughs> turducken and wear stupid hats and and just watch Al's football on a Monday afternoon I uh and get paid for it <laughs> yep hey, that is uh, that <laughs> is. and don't forget deep fried turkey at our tailgate oh that's worth a road trip man <laughs> <laughs> I, uh, I watched a lot of Alouette football this week, at least. Uh, and I know you're a bit of a history guy, Tim. I watched the, the 1970 Grey Cup reunion. I watched the CFL in 40, the Ice Bowl. I avoided the 2010 Grey Cup. They beat my riders. I didn't want to go through that. <laughs> um, but I'm guessing that you've been enjoying uh, kind of reliving the history of Al's football this week. Oh, I love it. I mean, it's, you know, for a guy who really only started – Really, you know, I only didn't. I only saw my first Alouettes game in '96 after moving back to Canada. I loved it because it's get to see the history, especially what the Alouettes put out this week for uh, for Grey Cup Unite. You know, with the stuff with Peter Delariva and the, just the look back at the at the the Grey Cups itself, and just seeing the different history that the that the Alouettes have been able to do, and how even though I hate the Big O, how packed the Big O was back then because it was just ruckus, and I think it. If we can ever get a Grey Cup back here again, obviously we all know it's only going to be at the Big O, so it's it can't get any you know can't get any better. I'll ask uh, both of you guys this: uh, Vernon Adams was just on the flight deck recently, right? And uh, uh, he's been using his voice to inspire change in the racial justice movement. And again, the Alouettes put out a video about that. He only turns twenty eight in January it, it blows my mind it feels like he's been in the league for a decade or more it must be exciting to finally because there's been a lot since AC retired it must be exciting to have a guy like that fronting your team without question I mean we've we've known Vernon since 2016 when he was a rookie he came in and he thought he was going to tear the league, league up in his first year and he pretty much had to eat a whole bunch of humble pie in the process but you know what I found that it made him a much better quarterback. It helped him grow. It helped him mature. And you see how he carries himself now. Like, he's still fiery. He's still passionate. But 
it's almost like he's able to say something and then back it up. And I think that's what's crucial is that he's able to be that leader. And he understands just how important it is. And he wants to be held accountable. Like we, when we had him on the podcast, like he kind of called me out for trying to sugarcoat the, uh, his play towards the end of the, the Eastern semifinal last year. I said, no, 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 don't sugarcoat it, man. Call it like it is. I, I did not play very well at the end. And to me, like that, that shows maturity as well, because some athletes, if you want to call them out, so to speak, or just mention, Hey, maybe you didn't play your best. They'll get up, upset. Vernon wants that. He wants to grow. He wants to be better. And you can tell that everything he does, even in his Instagram workouts, you see everything is all about getting better. And to me, like to have that kind of quarterback and know that he's going to be with Montreal for the next few years is a blessing. Like, like a lot of people are calling him like the second coming of Anthony Calvillo. I'm like, no, no, no. He's not the second coming of AC. He's the first coming of Vernon Adams. And that's what we want him to be. We want him to be that leader for years to come. And I'm excited. Like you're right. He's only 28 years old. And he's just getting, he's just going to get better and better as the years go by. Were you guys ta- talking about the, the draft earlier and how the, you know, how the Alouettes are losing their ninth pick because of the trade for Manziel and considering what the Owls have done recently, when it comes to their trades, this is for the first time, I'm going to say, I don't mind giving up a mm-hmm. first round draft pick for this dude. Now, considering what he's done and now what he's being paid, we just hope that he can continue and, and, and become the next big quarterback in Montreal. Awesome. We'll call that the the two and out live state of the East division. And uh, we're going to go on to the Western division right now. We'll start with uh, Andrew who is uh, inside the turf district right now. And I know he's got maybe the, the, the best setup of uh, all of us <laughs> right now. Like, look, <laughs> Hey dudes. Yeah. <laughs> this is just the one, this is one corner. I got to, you think I'd have got better at this being that, um, I got to, um, uh, you know, we've been doing all these Zoom calls that I would have properly tailored this to have all the right stuff showing. But, uh, you know, uh, surprisingly, time is of the essence sometimes. And uh, with uh, family and things to look after in the middle of all this, you, you kind of go with what you got. But, it's, uh, but it's, it's, a, it's a fun place to sit down and chat football, that's for sure. Well, before we get into... Uh, the Edmonton football team and everything that's going on with them. I do want to ask you about Joey Moss, uh, yes. just being from Edmonton. Uh, you know, I grew up as an Oilers fan and, and Joey Moss is part of my childhood. Just can you explain to everybody else just what Joey meant to the city and especially the two clubs there? Well, you're, uh, you're boy, you're starting off. You're going to choke me I up know. before you even I, get. Uh, I, I barely got through that. Yeah, you, you did well. You did well. <laughs> Pat on the back, good sir. Um, no, you know, Joey meant a lot to the to the league and to the teams here and to the fans. And, I mean, you just can't say there's there, there's no feeling that anyone would ever experience like when they watch Joey belt out the O Canada and just how he was just so passionate about everything. And, the players that got to know him knew and learned about people with disabilities, but they also just learned his passion for the city and their team that they played for. And so that's why you had guys that would play here and then they would move to another city and they would tell the people in the other city, like there's nobody like Joey, like everybody across the league knows Joey. And so it was a huge loss for us. Um, I'm really, really impressed actually with them doing the 50-50 that's actually going to support the Winifred Stewart Association, um, which is running right now. So if anybody wants to get their tickets, please, uh, I guess if you're in Alberta, I think you have to be in Alberta to do that. But um, I would do that. And uh, it's already the full pot, I think, is just under 500 grand right now. So it's, it's climbing and it's supporting an amazing thing and all doing it in the memory of Joey. Like there's, there's no better reason to... To, yeah there's no better reason not to you got to get in there mm-hmm. been a rough go for double e fans in uh, 2020 i know it you has- don't say <laughs> <laughs> breaking news <laughs> uh next year i mean they they just announced today that uh fans are going to be able to submit uh submissions for what they want the the team to be called next year and last it was two weeks ago i think the team president said that maybe they were searching for a new logo as well which is different from what we've heard up this point are we still gonna have the what's it gonna look like next year 
Okay. Well, uh, I'll, I'll go both sides of this. The first thing I will say is that, yes, he said there would be some changes to the logo, but I think they're going to be tweaks. I don't think they're going to go drastically different. If they did, uh, I, I think that's not a great move because you're looking at the fans want to have connection to the team still. And, and the logo, you can see it here on my lovely brand new hoodie that I just got. Funny, huh? I wanted to change the damn logo. I'm going to be so mad. Anyway, but, uh, <laughs> leave the logo. Let us keep that connection to the past. I absolutely am in, I, I know I'm not, not everybody is on the same um, level as me, I guess, or, this, or the, I don't want to say level, same thought process as me. Uh, I'm perfectly okay with the name change. I think we're at the time where that needed to happen. And, and I have a whole other story that I could get into, but I don't want to waste time on here. I just want to say that I think we're, we're ready for the name change. I'm not always, I'm not a fan of the way they're doing it this morning um, to just open it up because I think if it was a brand new team, I would absolutely get on board to say, yes, let's give your suggestions on what the name should be. Um, but I think at this particular moment, it needs to be like, why hash up the argument all over again? Because as soon as you put, what is, what are you going to suggest? 50% of the people are going to go back to the old name and they won't be able to get over it. Right. So mm -hmm. I think it would have been way easier if they would have said, okay, here's four names that we're, we're looking at. What's your favorite. And let's cut. And I think they will still do that down the road, but I think in this particular moment, it's kind of like, uh, guys, like, just let's just go with, uh, you know, get, give us the names and let's move forward. Let's stop opening the door to have to have the argument about the past. Oh, I love rehashing the past as a rider and Oilers fan. That's all I have. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> uh, sure. <laughs> and with the past, 1981 uh, Edmonton football team was named the greatest great cup champ uh, with whatever they used for the parameters. I wasn't exactly sure when I saw the bracket. Um, we know you're really young and uh, thank and, you. You know, you were barely, you were barely able to remember what happened in that great cup, but what do you remember about that team? Wow. You know, at, at this point, I'm just thinking, holy, I need to send Bra Brazilian Thai extra money. That's fantastic. Um, that's never a bad thing. <laughs> that's yeah. Never, yeah. yeah. Thanks. <laughs> thanks, Trav. <laughs> it's perfect. Um, <laughs> You know, well, now the funny thing is, is um, I remember more about that team because I watched so many of those things after the fact. Um, mm -hmm. That was right when I was getting into my fandom. I mean, I, I, I was six years old and 1980 was the first year that I went to a, a football game. And so in 81, I had, I got to go to, I think, two or three. Um, and all that I knew was that whenever I went, they won. And so that was exciting. That was great, right? And then must, as I learned, what's that? Must be nice. Yeah, I know. <laughs> yeah. And then as as I got older, and then I could understand the game more, and I could go back and watch some of that how they played in that time frame. And and I mean, Warren Moon was the guy that brought me into football, and uh, I. I was just, I couldn't believe that team. It didn't matter which position you were, you were in. They had a good guy playing that spot. So when you go back and watch it now, it's like, wow, the execution was just unreal. And, uh, and right now, actually in our, um, our cold snap league, uh, super fan Mike is playing as that 81 team and uh -huh. dominating as he should, because it just didn't matter. Like every, every, whoever you were throwing it to or Pat or giving the ball to, it was going and the defense was unreal. So it's, it, I mean, it's at a time where there is no salary cap and I understand that that definitely played a role. I'm not going to discount that, but Man, that, that team, was it was just solid everywhere. Let's uh, go to uh, Brian Warishan from the BC Lions Den, who is another team that's been making the news lately. <laughs> not really all positive news. N not any of it really positive lately. Uh, can we start talking about the late uh, David Braley, the longtime owner of the Lions? I mean, he's one of the major reasons the CFL is still here today, right? Yeah, and you know, anybody that's listened to my podcast over the last couple of years um, knows that I've been wanting an ownership change in, in BC for, for quite a while now. And it's got nothing to do with um, how David Braley supported the team financially. It was just the marketing aspect, um, the aspect that he was not of good health. He wasn't um, present in the market for the last couple of years. Um, but I'll tell you what, um, after he passed, uh, 
we found out that he left the BC Lions enough money in his will to survive for at least three seasons. Wow. Which is an incredible, mm-hmm. incredible gesture by that man. Um, not only has he helped this team in the past, other teams around the league in the past, but even after he's passed, he left that gift for the BC Lions because he knew um, it was going to take a while to find an owner. Um, you know, it's still up in the air. Well, what's going to happen to the team, whether the Braley family will maintain the team. I don't think they will. Um, we're hoping that, you know, some local ownership is going to step up, but um, for everything that, um, you know, David Braley has done for the Canadian football league, his final act uh, really touched me as a BC Lions fan. Um, I remember telling my wife, Susan about it. And uh, we both kind of teared up a little bit by that gesture. I mean, it was incredible. Uh, you know, just just to be able to do that and, and leave the Lions on good footing heading into a lot of uncertainty right now. Now, apparently, it's hard to talk about Ed Hervey uh, without talking Mike Riley and vice versa. What do you know about this whole uh, situation that's gone down? Uh, it sounds a little bit shady, uh, for one thing. Um, you know, when Ed Hervey all of a sudden stepped down as, as G- general manager of the BC Lions, it was given as personal reasons. And through a little bit of investigative reporting by Justin Dunk and and Farhan Lalji and other CFL insiders, the story that's going around now is that Ed Hervey and uh, Mike Riley's agent had some kind of side deal that was slipped under the the actual deal saying that uh, he's guaranteed a quarter of a million dollars in any circumstance. Um, And What's being reported is Rick Lala sure didn't know about this. David Braley didn't know about this. And this is the reason why Ed Herbie is not the general manager of the BC Lions anymore, not because of personal reasons. Now, the club has not confirmed or denied any of this. Uh, they're remaining silent on it. Um, you know, Justin Dunk and Farhan are saying, well, there's no rule in the Canadian Football League that allow, disallows these side deals or guaranteed money or anything like that. But if you're the general manager of a football team and you're not keeping your president and the owner up to date on these side deals or side deal that apparently happened, it's not a good look for the BC Lions. It's not a good look for the organization. It's not a good look that your owner didn't know about it. It's not a good look. I mean, I don't know how your owner doesn't know about a $250,000 guaranteed payment. So, you know, something doesn't add up here and, all I want as a Lions fan is the truth. I want to know if Ed Hervey was fired, if he left. Uh, because of this situation, Mike Riley has now filed a grievance uh, with the Players Association against the Canadian Football League to get his money. And I can't blame Mike Riley. I mean, if he signed something in good faith, um, thinking he was going to get this guaranteed money, then and it, and it stands up in court, he needs to get his money. But at the same time, uh, it's not a good look for the Lions. Uh, it's not a good look for the organization. And, and quite frankly, during a year of a pandemic, when you hire, when you sign Mike Riley to come in and be the face of your franchise, and he's been basically invisible throughout this whole pandemic, he's not doing media for the club. He's not doing anything until this uh, situation is resolved. Um, so when you don't have your face of the franchise uh, out, on social media, doing things for the club. It's not helping sell tickets for next year. And um, the whole situation is just unfortunate. Is it likely, or do you think it's like that G.R.A. Simon comes in and takes over the Ed Hervey's position, or do you have any idea of, of who I, that could I don't be? really have any idea. I think there's two guys in-house that could probably mm-hmm. take over that job. Uh, Neil McAvoy has been with the Lions for a yeah. really long time. He's, he's been an assistant GM under Wally Bono head scout he's, he's done it all he started in the ticket department there so he's been there for a really long time um the popular choice i think is g roy simon because he is a face mm-hmm. that everybody in vancouver recognizes you can utilize that uh, he's been doing a lot of canadian scouting for the club um so you know he's 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 working his way up the ladder whether he's at the level yet where he can completely take control of a franchise and you know deal with the salary cap issues and all of that um, is another story. So right now we don't really know 
what direction they're going to go in. I think they're just kind of in a holding pattern right now with Rick Campbell uh, kind of taking over a dual role at the moment, which is something I don't think he's necessarily wanting to maintain mm -hmm. or just to be the head coach and coach football. But, um, you know, it, it's really on, up in the air right now. And, you know, for a name, yes, I think G.R. Simon is a top candidate, whether he's ready or not. I'm not sure. Let's quickly uh, go to uh, Robert Dalton of the Rouge Radio or just Rouge Radio. He is a Bomber fan. He's uh, sporting his championship gear. Right <laughs> <laughs> are the uh, are the jorts tucked away for winter yet they are actually i've got shorts I, I, I we had a first snowfall like a month ago so i was like oh okay and then and it started getting plus uh plus celsius degree weather about a week ago so i was like oh damn it uh so yeah there i i thought with the recent snowfall i think it's they're safely tucked away in the in the closet for at least another three or four months i think march so i'll dig them out Unlike that bomber fan that didn't he wear his shorts for 18 years straight or something? He, he, apparently he wore, he didn't wear pants at all. I'm not, uh, it, it's too cool to not wear pants. I mean, uh, I mean. He wore pants like, like a handful of times, but yeah. yeah. <laughs> like funerals, like family made him wear pants. But other than that, he always wore shorts. Uh, I mean, I, I, kudos to him. I, I'm not going to yeah. go that far. <laughs> I do have to ask you, man, 29 years. I mean, does it still feel good a year later? It does. It, it does. Knowing, knowing that uh, no one could, uh, could beat us this year. I mean, you know, not going to, I mean, we, I mean, I, the, the old wrestling fan in me has me in my head, like Howard Finkel saying, and still great cup <laughs> champions of the CFL. Uh, so, I mean, it, it's, it sucks for the CFL because, you know, I'm a, I'm, you know, as much as I'm a homer for the for the Bombers, I'm a CFL fan through and through. And so to to not have any CFL football, I mean, TSN has done whatever it's can to replay every rider loss known to man. And I'm thankful for that, apparently. So I'm, I'm thankful. Well, it's a good thing they have five channels. Yeah. <laughs> um, but, I mean, it's it, it sucks. It's uh, I'm, I'm, I'm emotionally... Uh, whatever word you can use to, to describe it, I'm, it's, it just hurts. Uh, like I said, I'm a CFL fan through and through. And um, no, it's 2021. I mean, I'm not going to throw in the, 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 the Randy Ambrosi optimistic. Uh, but, the, you know, with the, the schedule being released, it, it looks as though that there's a plan and whether or not it's going to be able to allow fans and stadiums. 2021 is looking promising. It seems other than Calgary, uh, the Blue Bombers, they sort of have the most stability in the coaching staff. That must uh, make you feel a little good heading into whenever football picks up again. It does. Uh, now, I find it kind of funny that the Bombers had actually announced their defensive uh, staff prior to the 2020 offseason. So that was kind of funny. And now they, yeah, it looks like that Richie Hall is coming back. I think the only uh, coach that's not coming back, obviously, is Paul Apolis. Uh, and I believe Glenn Young, who went to Toronto to be their defensive uh, coordinator. So they're missing a lineman coach, which is great. Buck Pierce. I'm, I'm really interested to see what Buck Pierce can do with his offense next year. Uh, he's very calm, cool, and collective. And But, I mean, if you get to talk to him on a personal basis, the guy's really, really brilliant. I'm looking how that uh, transfers over into the football field. Uh, let's uh, let's go to well, staying on the prairies. Uh, we go to Saf from the Piffles podcast. I mean, personally, Saf, what was it like being in Regina, the city that's supposed to be hosting the Grey Cup today? You know, what? I have to say, it hit me twice. Number one, as a CFL fan, you know, walking around the city, not seeing all the jerseys, but I also drive Uber on the side, and this would have been my busiest week of the year. No with kidding. with all the CFL people in the city, so I would have just hired you on standby for the whole weekend. Oh yeah, I would have been I would have been on the payroll for the for the CF Pod Network for sure. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> but it definitely hasn't been fun watching or just walking around, driving past the stadium, knowing what was in store for this weekend, and now having to wait until twenty twenty two. It's it, it's a tough feeling. Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. The, the twenty nineteen Riders did have a big veteran presence. Uh, it's fair to assume that every team is going to look quite different next year. <laughs> How different? Are the riders going to look? You, you know, it seems appropriate that we didn't get a season this year. As, as a Saskatchewan fan, we we finally find our franchise quarterback. Yeah. <laughs> and and now we got to wait until next year to get him for one year, hopefully longer. Who knows what, what this team is going to look like? There was such an 
a veteran team that a lot of those guys are going to walk away. They didn't lose much in free agency this year, but next year is a whole different Mm -hmm. ballgame. We don't know what the salary cap's going to be. We don't know much of anything beyond are we maybe going to (laughs) play? Yeah, yeah. Uh, did you, uh, are you going to use next time, uh, you know, a, a municipal election rolls around, use Uber to your advantage, man? <laughs> oh, absolutely. I, I did it this time. I offered to drive anybody and everybody to the polls. Oh, genius. <laughs> it's, 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 it's the best way to do it. You gotta, gotta buy votes wherever you can find them. <laughs> How's the, uh, recount status going there? <laughs> <laughs> I still say I won the election by a lot. The lawsuits are on their way. Off the count. <laughs> yeah. No, no, we've got to keep the count going for a long time. <laughs> hey, congrats for doing that. And, man, I hope to see you at Mosaic next year because uh, it's, uh, it's a big, beautiful building sitting there with nothing going on. I think that might hurt the worst. It absolutely – and I can see it from my office building. If I look out the window just right, I get to overlook Mosaic Stadium. And I, I, don't, I don't look out that window very often because I don't want to see it right now, just knowing – what mm-hmm. this year this this was a year where we were supposed to see a lot of positivity this was this was our year 2013 all over again is is how i felt and it, it definitely didn't turn out that way feels a lot more like 2009 <laughs> hey and the season right after 2009 it started with one of the greatest football mm-hmm. games ever played so if that happens again i maybe it's worth it uh, i mean maybe <laughs> As long as 2010 ends, ends or 2021 ends better than 2010 did. Yeah, yeah. Our fl- our flight deck friends will say, huh, let's end it the exact same way. <laughs> I, I, do, I do have to say it's appropriate that I follow the Bombers oh. fan who's talking about being still Grey Cup champion. And I should just highlight, I'm still the CF Pod Network fantasy champion. So L- Literally. Uh, I can't even mute him. him. Fantasy. And still. And still. <laughs> Keyword fantasy, yeah. <laughs> That's awesome. That's your state of the West division during uh, <laughs> 2 and Out Live, the virtual edition. Here's the deal. We're going to give away some prizes again. We're going to do some CFL trivia. Um, uh, Ty put these questions together, so I have no clue um, how hard they are or anything like that, but I think it's time uh, we get to this little uh, – contest we have planned here i got a big box of timbits sitting on uh, my desk and i am uh, honestly just dying uh to eat them so let's bring in uh the champion uh well <laughs> he ate a hundred timbits once in august so we gotta ask him about that that i don't know how i would feel after a hundred well, how did you feel after 18 pierogies not that good actually yeah <laughs> Weird. <laughs> it, I mean, normally I could eat 18 pierogies. It was the uh, a minute uh, that was the issue. <laughs> Peter Dyakowski, former former Hamilton Tie Cat, tell us about that 100 pierogi feat in August. Timbits. It was an ordeal. Oh, yeah. <laughs> tell us about the 100 uh, Timbits you put down. The first 20 were easy. And okay. then once I got to about 30, I realized that it might not be uh, quite the walk in the park I was thinking. Because, yeah, they're so light and fluffy at first. So you think it's going to be a breeze. Oh, yeah, it's 100. So when I got to about 50, that's when – oh, just for a bit of background for everybody. So this was for camp day. So yep, this right. is not the first time that I'm going to be eating Timbits for money. This was <laughs> camp day earlier this year. And my old teammate, we used to play side-by-side, Marwan H. He's a franchisee with Tim Hortons. Now he's got, like – 10 locations downtown Toronto, including this beautiful flagship at the Hockey Hall of Fame. So we joke, he's finally in the Hall of Fame. Now, he had me up there because he knows I'm always game and I'll typically say yes whenever I'm challenged to a feat of eating in spite of having promised my wife I was out of the game. So we, you know, we, we figured, okay, what would, be, what would be fun? Okay, how many can you eat? And so we, we thought, okay, well, let's, let's come up with 100 because – you don't know how, you know, I, I thought I was going to be get it, you know, no problem. But I thought no one really wants to see me, you know, trying to eat like the 140th or something. Because that's, that's not going to be good viewing. So, anyway, so I'm there. We're rolling. 50's hard. And when I got there, I had this doubt. 
This it's is, only halfway, man. <laughs> it's only halfway. <laughs> it was no longer easy. And uh, I, I should also say, I was up against, for the start, uh, I was up against Matt Shinetti. Now, yeah. he beat me out the gate. You can expect he's going to be good for a sprint. So he beat me on the first 10. And then he tapped out after about 20 or 25 or so. But, <laughs> you know, great sport. You know, good, good for... Uh, he uh, he did not shy away from the the challenge. He has a really nice bike, by the way. But anyways, oh. so so you know, you know now you know Genetti's just cheering me on along with everybody else. And I'm, I'm I'm realizing I can't let people down now. And we've got a lot of matching donations that would only kick in once I hit a hundred. So I, I my um, uh, my company scholars we had pledged uh, to match. Uh, the uh, the big ticket donations. So uh, Marwan Hage was, was putting up a thousand. Adriano Belly had up a thousand. Uh, we, we were all ma all matching only if it hit a uh, hundred timbits and we had a lot of others. So we ended up raising a lot of money there. But fifty was tough. Sixty was really hard. And seventy, I, I thought I might I might not do this. <laughs> and it became a, a, it became like a slog. Like. <laughs> the, to get there, it took like, you know, 15, 20 minutes or something. But then like the rest, like the last 30 took about, you know, 40 minutes to get there. Oh. By about like, 85, I thought, I'm not going to do this. But as soon as I got into the 90s, I was like, I can do anything. Like, you can, <laughs> you know, you can eat 10, just 10 more. So they're playing the Rocky soundtrack, you know, the Rocky Four, you know, classic uh, montage music. So we had that going and I made it. So when I got asked to come help with this. I had one, I'm usually a very easy yes. I had one big precondition. Not a hundred. It's going to be time limited and <laughs> only a certain number of tickets. So uh, we each have a box of 25 here. We'll, we'll get to them <laughs> right away here. Did you have any, you're a smart guy. You're Canada's smartest person. Like you, I feel like you'd be a guy that would think about the strategy, how you're going to, get the hundred down or how you're going to eat this fast enlighten me what, what's your strategy well you know what everyone has a plan until the uh till the bullets start flying so i had i had a strategy but in the end it just but the strategy was perseverance and I, you know went back to my you know the programming that was instilled in me under nick saban back in college you know, the, the, the conditioning programs, you just have to focus on that next, that next goal. Also dipping them in coffee, that really works. So I, I do have two coffees here. Coffee so. It's a little late here, so it's a decaf. Okay, awesome, awesome. Uh, we, we, we weren't able to get any Hamilton representatives on just to talk about the Thai Cats. I just want to ask you generally, the no CFL season really hit me at Labor Day. Can you really put into words what Labor Day in Hamilton means. You've played in so many of those games. You know, it's that, it, that felt so strange to have Labor Day weekend and, and no football here because it is a very special day. You know, I, I know across the league we have a couple of Labor Day matchups, but none is quite so meaningful uh, and historic as Labor Day in Hamilton. Sorry, you know, I've got a, I played in uh, the matchup out West too, but yeah. that, it just it just felt weird. There was and everyone was talking about it. And even in, you know, early in my first couple uh seasons, you know, 07, 08, we were three and fifteen. But if we won on Labor Day, you know, all always always forgiven. Yeah. So to miss that, and I'm not a big conspiracy theorist. But when you look at the Tie Cats roster, stacked, poised to just just sleepwalk to the Grey Cup this year. You know, you start wondering if maybe other teams wanted to have an easy excuse. <laughs> <laughs> so I, uh, I had a, I was on an Argo podcast and they've basically claimed you as a legend. Like there's going to be a Diakowski banner at BMO field. <laughs> this is the craziest thing. And it just goes to show how, you know, rumors can start if you've ever played a game of telephone. You know, uh, in school, you, you whisper, you whisper something. You know, like uh, uh, Easter this year is on a Tuesday, and then by the time it goes around to to the uh, to the to the other end, it's yeah. something something just ridiculous. It makes even less sense than that. So, 
I, I think it might have started because I've, I've played a lot of games against the Argos. So there's a lot of pictures of me standing close by Argonauts players. And I, I think in the off season in 2017, the league had some snafu in their uh, their database, which, which reported transactions. So there's this whole story came up. People are saying I played for the Argos or I signed a contract with the Argos, which I mean, you know, any yeah. reasonable person can look at the facts and say, okay, that obviously never happened. But it's just become this big thing, right? And, and, and you know, going talking about conspiracy, conspiracy theories, people think I actually signed a contract in free agency with the Argos, which is, it's just ludicrous. You know, I, you know it, just take a few steps back, right? And, and, and look at it from a, a logical perspective and then we'll say, okay, well, that obviously never never happened, but it's, it's become a big thing. And, you know, if you spend enough time on the internet, you'll read, you'll read everything. I want to get one more story from you because as a as a Rough Rider fan, I think one of the greatest pranks of all time, and maybe you're still going to kayfabe me to use a rest <laughs> that you you created sort of a, a fake alias, fake professor. Now I look like I'm buying into conspiracies that did this study saying Tie Cat fans are the best fans. <laughs> in the CFL and then the Regina media just were all <laughs> over it. Did you think it would go that far? I I had no idea, but yeah, I put out, I, I put out a tweet by the end of the day, I was booking interviews on the radio. We had, uh, <laughs> we had the good professor on the green zone. <laughs> like you didn't even, you just threw out a tweet and it just, there was no plan behind us. Just having fun. <laughs> <laughs> and, and, you know, and now that I've, I've I've played out there, I completely understand how it got taken seriously. Mm. Right, right. Um, you are still involved with the PA. Before we start polishing uh, back these timbits, the one thing that I uh, learned from the players this week is that they want to play in 2021. It almost seems like they want to play no matter what. They still love this game. They just want to be on the field more than anything. The players want to play. The players want to play this year. We did so much work to develop. So for anyone else um, who may not know, I've been um, on the board with the Players Association for years. I'm our, our treasurer. And, uh, we have uh, our uh, five-man executive committee who also uh, form uh large portion of our bargaining committee. So we did a lot of work uh, over this spring and summer with the league to develop um, a way to play this year. And it's such a shame that it, it, it didn't come to fruition. The work that went into um, everything necessary to have this that short six game bubble season in Winnipeg so we could still award a great cup, have a champ, the guys could play, we would have football. Uh, you should see the 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 the, the hub city um, health guidelines and um, safety protocols document. There is, you know, just a, a, a masterpiece uh, of uh, uh, of work and was approved by the province of Manitoba. It had um, more or less the federal assent uh, necessary, and it, it fell apart on questions of funding very very late in the process. You know, we were at a point where guys would have had to start going into quarantine isolation you know within a couple of weeks and the you know the league got news that they weren't expecting from the government and it, obviously we're here right we're not we're not in Regina right now it's it's mm -hmm. it's a shame we should have played this year some uh, and, and if we look at the the NHL and see just how successful they were it's too bad but I'm pretty confident that we'll be able to get things worked out with the um um with all the challenges present to, to play next year. I hope so. I mean, it's, I rolled my tie cats, uh, season C credit for till next year. So. <laughs> uh, yeah. I'm hoping to be in the stands too. Okay. Let's uh, get back and do these Tim bits. So here's the deal. The, the, the previously gr agreed upon rules are, we both have an assorted pack. Um, and also, it's going to be the first to eat 25 or two minutes, right? Or do you want to do all 25? Let's do 25 or two minutes. Spare the people. It's a, it's a sprint, right? It's a sprint, not a marathon. Now, I've got – so just so – you know, I, I know we're going to count, and we've got a lot of referees watching, but here's a box of 20, okay? 
And I also got a box of 10. So there's two, four, five. That was like the NHL draft lottery. Yes, that is the New York Rangers logo. It's like, yeah, Gary, we get it. Oh, I only have 25. There's a possibility that I run out. <laughs> That's the hope. That's the fix. If I... <laughs> so I've got my coffee. Okay. 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 I've also got, I got my team issue. Okay. Water bottle. Okay. Uh, Brazilian Thai is the official timekeeper. And okay. we have uh, Ryan Ballantyne. Uh, my favorite joke to say this year is that the Riders are undefeated and the Stampeders are winless. So uh, welcome. <laughs> well, yeah. I, I like that you you were like, let's talk about every team in the Western Division. And then you didn't even bother bringing up the Stamps except to say that they have a consistent coaching staff. Like well, that's the only, that's the only I, Stampeders talk we got. Uh, we just ignored the fact that they exist. Uh, okay, which you know, is par for the course for Regina fans. They want to forget the Stamps exist because then they'll believe they have a chance. Let's give you 60 seconds here. You know what? When, when <laughs> we long. thought we the bubble in Winnipeg, um, I thought that was advantage Stampeders because there would be no question about Bo's health. And I think until 2021, he's going to be uh, ready to just run it up on the rest of the league, isn't he, Ryan? I own it. Yeah, I think Bo having an extra year off to rehab his shoulder and really get it right is going to be incredibly dangerous for uh, for everybody else in the league. The guys, you know, um, with half a shoulder, he was able to get to a Grey Cup championship and win it in 18. Uh, the Stampeders were good enough to host a playoff game with their backup quarterback playing seven starts uh, last year. So I'm not at all surprised to see. Uh, I wouldn't be surprised to see Calgary in the top of the mix. Plus, when you talk about all this shuffling of free agency and everything else, there's been no team better than Calgary at mining talent throughout this process over the last decade since John Huffnagel came into the league, so uh, or came back into the league as it were in 2008. Uh, so it won't, it wouldn't surprise me if the Stampeders have a bunch of no-name players that are all of a sudden all stars and carrying them on their way to another championship. Oh, those, uh, it, they're, they're the steady Nelly, I think. And, uh, I, I'm not, I don't think you're worried, certainly, of them, uh, dropping, uh, you know, to no. the No, they'll, they'll be in the game next year in Hamilton and, and they'll keep that drought a going, uh, <laughs> despite the, uh, the league doing everything they can to engineer more Canadian talent getting on to the Tiger Cats and, and the desperate need to end that drought by rigging the draft to make sure that they got the best pick. We're uh, talking and, about conspiracy theories. And three picks in the <laughs> two picks in the top ten, I believe. Um, so uh it's uh it's not bad for for Thai Cats fans to see uh them get their their just desserts. You know, that 15 and 3 team really needed the draft rig for them too. Um, you know, if you can't get over the hump at this point, I don't know what's gonna do it. <laughs> this is gonna be so flavors for tweets now. Once we, uh, <laughs> I'm going to let the, the official timekeeper, Brazilian tie in the ring announcer slash commentator, Brian Ballantyne, take it away. Ladies and gentlemen, boys and girls, children of all ages, today a titanic face-off between the two-time defending champion, Travis Curra, the prince of poutine, the baron of brisket, taking on Canada's smartest person, badge-earning boy scout, and Toronto Argonaut great Peter Diakowski, who steps in to eat one Timbit for every three days that he belonged to the Toronto organization. He'll be standing up, waiting desperately to take on the king of foods in Travis Curra. You look at their body types and you figure there's no chance Diakowski has here. Travis takes up a studio wall full of space. And yet Diakowski steps into the ring, desperate to challenge the champion and take home the title as he did as Canada's smartest person. Although one has to question that now that he's decided to take on the king. If we have our timekeeper ready. In three, two, one, start. All right, Travis in. He's gone with a couple. Oh, all ready to the drink. 
As I see Peter dunking them in the coffee, a little Gatorade behind it as well. All I see is Travis's cup with a minute 45 to go. I can't tell how many they've inhaled. If anybody's got it, a, a count in the chat, it would help because these two guys are going at one another, asking if Peter's using blue Gatorade like his double blue Argo history. But it looks like it's got a little Thai cat yellow to it because we know what color he bleeds. Travis firing them back with a minute 21 to go. A chocolate glaze now in for the challenger. More liquid for Travis as he tries to get his way through. The jelly donuts may be the problem donuts for people here because the jelly, the powder will stick. It'll dry out your mouth. They'll really need to go. Peter firing them in. It's got to be an empty mouth at the end once we get all 25 in or once we get to that two-minute mark. Now 52 seconds left to go. Another in for both contestants here. And unfortunately, unlike past years, I can't see the plate, so I can't give you any indication of who is going to be the new champion. 40 seconds to go. Peter throws his box up. Oh, he's got a massive lead on Travis, who seems to have mostly the powdered donuts in there. Could be unfortunate, but Travis goes too hard in, and Diakowski looking like he might take it. Could he defeat the reigning champion? 20 seconds to go now. As Diakowski fires more back, it's going to have to be an empty mouth. I will give you that five-second countdown because if it's in your mouth, it's not enough. Five seconds to go. Four, three, two, one. Swallow it. Let's see what you... Oh, Diakowski throws in one after the buzzer. I don't know if that one will count. We will have to find out, but let's see those boxes. Peter shows... I believe it looks like there are five left in there. Is that correct? Five remaining. Five remaining. Travis is down with far more than five. The towering titan of Timbits <laughs> is Peter Diakowski. Wait. That was a ball. There we go. Wait. We, we have what? a tie. What do you mean you have a tie? He had a box of 20. He's got five left. I had but a box he of He added five more. He added five from he his box of He had a 10. box of 20 and a box of 10, and he added five into that box. Yeah. On camera, we counted them together. Let's see the two boxes. <laughs> he showed the two boxes, I promise. Yeah. Yeah. I was watching. This is legit. Okay. This, this is legit. There's the five. Now, hold on. Everyone watch me transfer five. The thing is, the Tim Hortons... In Maine and Wentworth, they like me, and they're very generous. So they put 12 into my other little box, so there will be seven in here. But it's not because I cheated. It's just because <laughs> they, I smile and they give me a few gotcha. extra every time. Oh, my God. All right, well, now it reports lawsuits have been filed by the Cura camp. We got many jurisdictions. And jurisdictions now. Not, not only did Peter win on the money line, he covered the spread. I need a recap. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, I mean, based on what we saw, I believe five Timbits left in Peter's box. Looks like ten Timbits left in Travis's box. Yep. And, and, he, so and he gets like, to sleep on the couch. <laughs> yeah, it looks like uh, we see uh, Peter Diakowski has been. I, I believe if we check with all of our media affiliates, they have all. Uh, all yes, they all projected <laughs> that Diakowski is the <laughs> winner of this contest. Podcast um, Network calling this contest. Yeah, look, the CF Pod Network is officially calling it for the new champion. I concede. Peter Diakowski. <laughs> it, when, it'll be on his Hall of Flame or his Hall of Fame plaque at some point. Two time CFL All Star. I think two and out live. A, uh, donut eating champion, Timbit eating champion, and long time. Argo legend. <laughs> <laughs> he beat me by five Timbits. That's not even close, man. No, the line no. was only one and a half. Yeah, oh. he, he, I mean, he beat you by like 30%. Like it's yeah. not like a versus what you ate versus what he ate. You're looking at a 30% difference. That's, that's pretty substantial. I like the comments that say, uh, Janice said, oh, the 
disappointment in 2020 continues. <laughs> yeah, I mean, this is this was exactly what 2020 deserved. Travis losing an eating contest because, of course, it was going to happen the, the, that way this year. That's how 2020 has shaken out. Peter, uh, thank you for being a good sport and taking part in this silliness. I can. I can see how you would feel like absolute garbage after 100 team wins. <laughs> <laughs> My only regret when I saw that money line, you know, not pulling a Pete Rose and putting some down on myself. <laughs> I, I, nobody, nobody sent me an e-transfer, so I have, I don't have to pay anybody. <laughs> nobody <clears throat> wanted to bet against Travis. Well, why would you? One and a half. <clears throat> I mean, again, he bone crushed Derek Dennis last year. Oh, well played, sir. He's some sort of pun on whatever Zach Evans' nickname is the year before. <laughs> um, so it's, it's uh, yeah, I, I don't know. The, uh, guys, the, thank you so much for taking part in this. We do have some trivia to do. We have. Uh, I totally forgot about that. Yeah, we have some more uh, gift cards. <laughs> To give away. We've got more game codes to give away. Five questions. So the attendees, when uh, Ty asks the question, raise your hand. Sheldon, he hasn't asked the question. Uh, so <laughs> I actually, I have a Mike question can't for the win anything. Play guys, if they're around. Uh, I, I, think I have the game, and I, I, I love it. I, I enjoy playing it. I think it's great. Oh, well, see, Canada's smartest person because he knew he could beat you. Um, <laughs> I have a question about uh, the game, um, if they're still here. I don't think they're still here. Because I know that Canadian rosters existed on CFL Sim, which, by the way, another Homer game there from Rod and the crew. Uh, I think Saskatchewan to through the West. somebody uh, redid the PC version. Maybe yeah. I'm and added the but CFL. I was just going to ask them if they could make the Canadian rosters available, like they built them for the CFL Sim. As a as an update, oh, we gotta I'd wait. I'd love to the, just not have to do that myself. We gotta wait for the league on that one, I think. Uh, but or the PA, maybe, Mister Treasurer, just telling them that they can <laughs> use your player rights. Because if I'm not mistaken, the player rights belong to the CFLPA, not the league. Correct? Player likeness right? Well, I don't want to spoil any surprises. <laughs> oh. I just Leaving thought that the, was within contract. I know Bo has been asking about personal uh, sponsorships, and that came out on Three Down the other day, but uh, I was curious as to whether or not I, – I thought I read somewhere that someone said that the rights to the player's likeness belongs to the PA, not the league. I want Yes. Yes. I got a, a guest on here. <laughs> awesome. Let's no, do the yeah. – Okay. Yeah. yeah, yeah. So, uh, so I don't want to spoil any surprises, but um, uh, I'm a big fan of that um, that video game effort, and uh, you know, hopefully we see some uh, cooperation soon. Awesome. I think, I think yeah. he just basically pleaded the fifth, but <laughs> kind of gave an answer. All right. Better, I, better than uh, Jeffrey Orange. <laughs> Everybody have their uh, hands ready. Uh, I think it's cheating if I. Uh, I don't think – should the Pod Network people be eligible, Ty? Everybody but Mike. Okay. Everybody <laughs> to, uh, to play. Okay, Ty, what's the first question? This is uh, for uh, Xbox One or – yeah, Xbox One, Doug Flutie, Maximum Football. All right. I'm going to start with the GOAT, obviously, Louis Pisaglia. Uh, <laughs> how many converts did he miss throughout his career? 10, 3, 24, or 13? Okay, Sheldon is the first one uh, to raise his hand. Um, unmute. Uh, what are you guessing, Sheldon? We need the Jeopardy theme song, I think. <laughs> well, I think someone unmuted him and then someone else muted him again. Don't play and that. I'll have, I'll have flashbacks. Oh, yeah, yeah. Yes, <laughs> So is it one of those things, Peter, where you just nailed it at home and then under the lights it was rough? Oh, yeah. I'm the guy at home watching and whenever someone's not doing it, I'm like, how did this guy get on the show? How did they let this guy out there? And, and now I know. <laughs> <laughs> it's all about the timing with the signaling device. <laughs> okay, it's... we're going to go to Ty's mom and see. If, uh... Oh, good. 
even <laughs> the answer. I don't know who she would give the gift code to. <laughs> okay, we might have to do this in the chat and uh, do it that way. This was this was. Oh, I think Ty's mom's unmuted. Can you hear me? I tried. Yes, we can hear you. What was what was the uh, four answers? Ten, three, thirteen, and twenty-four. I'm just gonna go lucky thirteen. Oh, okay. <laughs> Steven, you're up. Who's up? Me. Yeah. Yep. <laughs> Oh, I wasn't paying that close of attention. Okay, I'll go 10. No. Oh, holy. <laughs> okay. Jordan is uh, next here. I think he's unmuted now. I think I'm going to go with uh, three. Yep. Oh, three converts in his like 40 year career. <laughs> yep. Also holds the record for 560 consecutive made converts. Wow. Question number two. Yes. Who was the first quarterback to throw for 5,000 yards in the CFL? <laughs> okay, Will, I put your hand up. Warren Moon? I am. Yeah. Oh, he got it. Back to back years, 81 yep. or 82 and 83. Yes, sir. I have that. That person was just a guess. Now we've got, uh, the second guy was wrong, too. <laughs> now we've got $50 to sport check tie. What's your next? Ooh, I got to go with a hard one if it's for 50 then. Uh, okay, there's been two players that have won MOP and then went on to win Coach of the Year later in their careers. Who are they? Where's Superfan oh. Mike when we need him? You know, he's ineligible. <laughs> he's ineligible. <laughs> oh, that's not fair. That's, come on. It's entirely yeah, you're not fair. allowed to Google results. Yeah, yeah, because he's And Mike's the brain is Google. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah. Do we have any takers on this one? I think I know one, but I can't think of the second. Okay, well, what's your first one? I thought I saw Steve's hand go up in the chat again, or did it never come down? Or Sheldon, maybe? Yeah. Julian I, answered. I was thinking about it. Okay, we'll, we'll take a guess. I was going to say Huffnagel. And I'm going to, uh, I want to, I don't want to say, but I was thinking Kent Austin. No. You got one right, though, right? Wrong on both accounts. Oh, geez. Yeah, Huff, Huff was never league no, MVP. Never, yeah. <laughs> Did MOP. Dickinson win MOP? Oh. MOP. Oh, Did Dickinson win MOP? Are you answering or are you asking? Yeah, I'm asking. <laughs> <laughs> I'm guessing. And if you get the right answer, you're answering. <laughs> okay, so Dave Dickinson is one. One, yeah. Brian, do you know the other? Who, me? No. I was going to no. say Kent Dawson, but... Oh. Is it it is a Rough Rider connection. It is a Rough Was Rider. Was it Dave Dave Dickinson and Ronnie Lancaster? Yes. yes. Ooh. Uh, Ooh. Nice pull. Okay. 50 bucks to Canadian Tire. What is uh, the question, Ty? Who was the first coach to coach in both a Grey Cup and a Super Bowl? Oh, this is hard. <laughs> Head coach? Okay, Trevor Nelson put his hand up in the comments, and I am uh, – uh, asked him to unmute. Trevor, uh, do you know the answer? Uh, that's got to be uh, Marv Levy. No. Oh. We're going back to what, the 50s tie? Yeah. Oh, Cliffy, do you know? Bud Grant? Yes. yes. Yeah, that's yeah. the only one. I should have known that. Okay. Now we have 50 bucks to Mark. Ty, what's the last question? Okay. From 1991 to 1998, only two players won CFL MOP. Who were they? <laughs> I didn't think these were that bad. We all know one. Yeah. Yes, Everybody's trying to think of the second one. Yeah. <laughs> I couldn't make them that easy. We know one. Oh, let's go to Michael Dennis. He's got his hand up. 
Let's see if we can oh. get him mute. Okay, right. taking a guess here. Flutie and Ham. No. Damn. Okay. Oh. Is a running back. Oh. Gotta be like oh, yeah. Quiet, you. <laughs> <laughs> One is a running back. I think uh, Montreal and Edmonton fans should know him well. Come on, Andrew. Okay, Baltimore I got. Fans. Okay, it's okay. So it's got. It, I got it. Then it's got. It's got to be Flutie and Pringle. Yes. Yeah. Okay. There it is. All there right. we go. Well done, guys. Uh, <laughs> as soon as you said running back, I'm like, I think that's got to be in there. Yeah. yeah. Before we let you go, I'm gonna try and unmute and uh, unban people from talking on the camera, and let's try to get a virtual selfie all together. <laughs> Really cool. I'm glad uh, you guys uh, spent the Grey Cup that wasn't with uh, us here on uh, Two and Out Live, the virtual edition. Uh, it is brought to you by Park Power. Uh, they are a, a provider of electricity and natural gas here in Alberta. And shopping local now is more important than ever before. I think we all all know that. So if you can make the switch, you live in Alberta. Uh, switch to Park Power and uh, their owner, Chris Kozowski, uh will uh, be very happy you made the switch and they love and support the Alberta Podcast Network. Learn more at parkpower.ca. Thank you so much for joining us for Two and Out Live.